Some of the most amazing mysteries in the world are also some of the oldest. Our ancient ancestors left us with an endless number of puzzles when they disappeared. Many of those puzzles have never been solved. In a lot of cases, we don't even understand the technology they had at their disposal, or even how they came to have that technology in the first place. It's easier to show you what we mean than tell you. So, allow us to show you. A little over 4,000 years ago, a brand new pigment was invented in ancient Egypt. Today, we call it Egyptian blue, and it was originally developed to adorn a crown on a famous bust of Nefertiti. We have no way of knowing whether the chemists who came up with it were aware of what they were doing at the time, but there's far more to this pigment than just a pretty color. This brilliant shade of blue can reduce energy consumption and can also amplify solar energy output if applied in the right way. In early 2020, a German research team even used Egyptian blue to create new nano sheets for infrared imaging. To give the substance its proper name, Egyptian blue is calcium copper silicate and is thought to be one of the first ever artificial colors ever created by human hands. It's a stunning color and was used in the time of the New Kingdom to decorate everything from statues to sarcophagi. When a very thin layer is exfoliated from a grain of the pigment, a nanosheet 100,000 times thinner than a human hair can be created, and the properties of that sheet are ideal for optical imaging. Now we know that, this ancient substance might be responsible for the next great era of microscopy. You might think you know fashion, but we don't think you can make that claim until you've seen the world's rarest textile. This little number is made from the silk of more than one million spiders. This golden cape is thought to be the largest piece of cloth ever made from the produce of golden silk or weaver spiders, and was exhibited to the world for the first time in 2009. The creation of the piece was a collaborative effort between British art historian Simon Pears and his American business partner Nicholas Godley. It took them five years and approximately $400,000 to finish the garment. Pears was inspired by the tale of a French Jesuit missionary, attempting to do something similar without success in the 19th century. Pears and Godley had the advantage of a machine that could extract silk from 24 spiders simultaneously without harming the spiders. All of the spiders were returned to the wild once their work was done. The resultant garment is strong, light, thin, and flexible. If it were easier to produce the base material, the fabric would have a variety of uses. We're not the type of people who like to point at something seemingly miraculous and say, that was definitely aliens. But we do find ourselves looking at the genetic disc and thinking, all right, this might have been aliens. The lidite carved disc, which is lightweight and not even a foot across, contains detailed carvings so intricate that you need a microscope to appreciate what they represent. Not only that, one side of the disc represents the birth process of a human being, from sperm to fetus to egg. We have two major issues here. The first is that designing things at the microscopic level should be impossible without a microscope. The second is that such detailed information about the fetal process shouldn't have been available to humans when this disc was made 6,000 years ago. It was discovered in Colombia, but the style and design of the disc don't match that of any known pre-Columbian society. A snake is running around the outer edge of the disc, and there's a hole in the middle, as if it were intended to be spun like a vinyl record. Is it an elaborate fraud or the work of an advanced, but now forgotten, civilization of the past? Pumapunku in Bolivia is already one of the most mysterious ancient sites in the world. If you're familiar with archaeology and ancient history, you may already know about it. By far the most mysterious thing about this ancient temple complex near Tiwanaku, though, is the way all of its enormous megalithic stone blocks fit into place so perfectly without any mortar. They fit so tightly that you can't even pass a razor blade between where the stones meet, if we didn't know better, we'd say that they'd been created by machine. That would certainly explain why and how there are so many precise drill holes in the stones. 
However, Puma Punku was created more than 1,000 years ago. We don't know which civilization built the site, but we do know that they didn't have a writing system. How is it possible that they did all this without any advanced technology? People sophisticated enough to achieve this should have become the dominant culture in the region, but instead it seems they have disappeared completely. It's a total mystery and not one we expect to be solved anytime soon. When a farmer started digging into his field in Shika Island, Japan, all he wanted to do was repair an irrigation ditch. When his shovel hit a collection of heavy stones, he was initially irritated that they were in his way. But when he looked at them properly, he realized that the rocks had been arranged as a case for something else entirely. Lifting the stones away one by one, he eventually unveiled the solid gold treasure that's now known to the world as the King of Na Seal. The exact origin of the decorative object is unknown, but the most commonly accepted story is that it's an ancient Chinese artifact that was presented as a gift to the Japanese envoy by Emperor Guangwu of Han. That was in the year 57. The ancient date would be consistent with the five symbols etched onto the surface of the seal, which identify it as not only the seal of the King of Na, but also that the King of Na rules the state of Wa. That's what Japan used to be called when it was under the control of the Han Dynasty. How it came to be in a field so many centuries later is a question we don't have an answer to. In 1897, the statue, now known as the Lady of Elka, appeared overnight on a private estate in Valencia, Spain. Nobody knows how she got there, and she wasn't there the day before she was found. Because of its good condition, it was initially believed that the statue was brand new and might have been intended as a gift, but that theory was quickly dispelled after scientists got the chance to take a look at it. The statue is actually a funeral urn and contains the ash of a human body that was cremated about 2,500 years ago. The statue itself is also around that old, so the question of where it spent the 2,400 years before its sudden and dramatic appearance in Valencia is a puzzling one. It's now on public display in Madrid, where a number of rumors and superstitions have built up around it. Some people even say that if you look into its strangely piercing eyes for too long, you'll go mad. We're not sure about that, but we'll suggest that you don't look at these pictures too hard just in case it's true. During the peak of the Roman army's powers, we imagine that being attacked by its soldiers was a bad enough experience without being psychologically tormented at the same time. On the other hand, psychological warfare might have been one of the reasons the Romans were so successful. They didn't only want to defeat you physically, they also wanted to break you mentally. To do so, they used unconventional weapons like this. They're whistling sling stones designed to make noise as they sped through the air towards you some 1,800 years ago. The most recent discovered set of whistling stones was found in Lockerbie, Scotland in August 2021. The tiny holes drilled in each of the stones served a dual purpose. They would firstly make injuries worse because of their compressive effect on impact, and they would also make a dreadful noise as thousands of them whistled through the air at the same time. The noise is said to have terrified the native Scottish tribes when they faced the Romans on the battlefield. It's known that there was an enormous battle between the Scots and the Romans on nearby Burnswark Hill during the second century. These stones are almost certainly a leftover from that battle. There is no correct answer to the question, what color is the Lycurgus Cup? It could be one of two colors, depending on which direction you look at it from and how well lit it is at the time you're looking. The 1600-year-old curiosity has been intriguing and beguiling all of those who have seen it for centuries. The cup was made using dichroic glass, which can reflect light particles in a variety of different ways. If a light is shown from behind the glass, it will appear to be green. But if the light is shown from directly in front of it, the color turns to red. It's almost certain that the person who made it understood the principles of the glass that they were using, even if they didn't know why it behaved in the way that it did. Archaeologists have never found anything else like it, 
which perhaps isn't a surprise given how delicate the cup is, so we can't rule out the possibility that only one ancient Roman craftsperson ever understood the potential for the glass and how to make beautiful things out of it. The giant Noria of Hama looks a lot like the kind of Ferris wheel that you might see on a fairground, but it's far more ancient and impressive than a simple fairground ride. Rather than being a ride, it's a water wheel. What makes it unusual is that water mill wheels didn't become popular until the 16th century. These water wheels were built in Hara, Syria 2,500 years ago. To say that they were a little before their time would be a huge understatement. 17 of the wheels are still standing there today, although there used to be more before civil war and unrest blighted the region. It's possible that they're even older than 2,500. We know they existed in the year 469 BCE because they're referenced in a mosaic in the city of Apamea that was created in that year, but there's nothing to say they weren't already old by that time. This invention gave the people of Hama safe, fresh water to drink at a time when the concept of irrigation didn't even exist in many of the surrounding territories. They're so old that nobody even knows who invented them or where they got the idea from. The existence of Greek fire is an established historical fact. We know that it was used against the enemies of the Byzantine Empire at Constantinople in 673. Records from the time said that the fire was so powerful that it even spread across the surface of the water, spreading from ship to ship and wreaking havoc and terror. It was basically the ancient ancestor of the modern-day flamethrower. The secret of how to make Greek fire was guarded jealously by the Byzantines with good reason. It was the staple of their military success, and it gave them a huge advantage against any opponent. When their empire eventually fell, they took the secret with them. All of their contemporaries attempted to create their own version of Greek fire, and all of them failed. Even now, scientists aren't 100% sure what it was made of. It's likely that it would have been impossible without some combination of quicklime, sulfur, and phosphide. But other ingredients would also have been necessary, and we might never know what they were. Perhaps it's best that we never find out. The last thing the world needs is another weapon of mass destruction. The steam engine is viewed as the breakthrough that made train travel possible during the 19th century. But there was nothing new about the technology that powered those early trains. You can trace the existence of the steam engine all the way back to the Aeolopile, better known as Heron's engine, on account of the fact that it was invented by a hero of Alexandria. History might give Hero too much credit, though. He finished his design during the first century based on earlier work performed by Tasibios over 100 years earlier. Hero's spherical engine is operated by boiling water beneath a steel sphere, which spins on its axis as steam begins to erupt from nozzles placed on opposite sides of the sphere. Hero worked on his design over time and eventually found a way to boil water inside the ball rather than externally. If anything, Hero was too far ahead of his time. He couldn't come up with a practical purpose for his engine, so he eventually grew bored with it. It took Taku al-Din looking at his work with fresh eyes 1,600 years later before something that looks more like the modern steam engine began to take shape, and that led to the invention of the steam train in England 100 years after that. Is the Voynich manuscript a beautifully elaborate practical joke or a message for humanity written in a code that nobody can translate. Academics have been arguing over that question ever since the manuscript was found in Rome in 1912, and they've yet to reach a conclusion. While there might be plenty of people who believe it's a forgery or a joke, Yale University in the USA is sufficiently convinced of its authenticity to keep it in the Beinecke Rare Book and Manuscript Library. The story of the manuscript prior to its 1912 discovery is unknown, but radiocarbon dating of the pages it's written on suggests it has a 15th century origin. The book runs to 240 pages and is full of mysterious illustrations. The illustrations would probably make sense to anybody who could read the script, 
but unfortunately, nobody can. The unknown author of the Voynich manuscript even provided a cipher for the code. But either the cipher doesn't work, or the academics who studied it don't understand it properly. The topics covered within the text are wide and varied. On one page, you might see a detailed picture of a flower. But on the next, there might be a drawing of a dress or a pair of shoes. This might be nothing but a 15th century home and fashion guide. But then, what would be the point of encoding it? Subscribe to the channel, turn on the notification bell, and enjoy watching new videos on my channel. Thanks for watching and see you soon!